So now this event's actually being recorded, I can actually uh, start in a more formal basis to welcome you to this uh, on Eden webinar this afternoon, which is number nine in the series on the use of OER and OEP as open educational resources and open educational practices in the online pivot. And it's a great pleasure for me to, today to present our two speakers, Kathleen Cronin and Martin Wellen. And I think they're people who are well known in the um, OER, OEP arena. And it's a great pleasure for us to have them here this afternoon. Catherine is um, Strategic Education Developer at Ireland's National Forum for the Enhancement of Teaching and Learning in Higher Education, um, where she collaborates across the educational sector, supporting digital and open education, including the development of digital capabilities, the use of OER and OEP, and the development of enabling policies for digital and open teaching and learning. Martin um, well, is the director of um, the Open Educational Research Hub at the Open University, and also the director of the GoGN Network. Um, he chaired the Open University's first major online e-learning course back in 1999, seems like prehistory now, which attracted um, 15,000 students and was the, the OU's first um, learning management system uh, director. His popular book, blog edtechie.net um, features his writings on different aspects of educational technology and uh, fortunately for us Martin actually uh, practices what he preaches because he's a, quite a prolific author and his books are also published in with an, an open license and two of them which are particularly worth mentioning are The Battle for Open which was published in 2014 and 25 Years of EdTech which has been published uh, this year. So um, one last final reminder before passing over to uh, our speakers to start is please use the chat for general conversation, put any questions you might have in the question and answer tool, and um, if you're on YouTube, you can put your questions on the, in, the, in, in there. Okay, and a little later on, there'll be a link if you haven't done so already, so please register for this event, and that way we can send you a digital badge for, for taking, taking part. So I'm going to shut up now and say thank you very much and, and pass over to Martin. Thanks, Tim. So I'm going to try uh, sharing my screen now. Make sure that I don't share my uh, my Twitter channel or anything. Uh, that's an odd scare. Okay, cool. So find it. I need to go back to the start. Pretend you haven't seen these slides. Cool. Um, good. Are you seeing that okay? Good, thanks, Catherine. <laughs> cool, yeah, so um, Catherine and I uh, were asked by uh, Tim to come in and do one of these uh, webinars. Um, I made a, a discussion about it uh, via Twitter DM most of the time, and we decided not to do a long presentation, just try and do just a short one each at the start to kind of, um, sort of set the tone, and then we're gonna have a a, a, a brief conversation between the two of us, really, just to sort of like flash out some of the issues and then hopefully open it up for um, the more general discussion to realize there might be a, a range of questions. Um, so, uh, this is our title use of OER and OEP open educational resources and open ed educational practice in the online pivot. And Catherine very helpfully put together uh, a list of the resources um, in that. Google Doc there as well. So if, you, if, it, if we're talking about anything and you think you'd like to follow up on that, there should be more there. Uh, so I'm going first. So I'm going to talk about open educational resources. And um, one of the things that I've noticed since the, the kind of online pivot that many people have been undertaking because of the pandemic, having to shift with the learn online, is there's been a big call for like, where can we get good quality content from? You know, if you're suddenly having to create an online course in a very short time frame. It's very difficult to write that from scratch. Um, I work at the Open University uh, and we typically take about two years with a multidisciplinary team to produce a, you know, a good online course. And many of you might be have a matter of weeks, months, when have to produce a good online course. There's a one way to shortcut that, um, but still make it kind of high quality, is to find content elsewhere that you can reuse and then write your content around that or write activities around that content. So uh, in making the case for open educational resources, so my, my, why might you use them? First of all, they're openly licensed. I'll come on to licenses in a minute. It means you can reuse them. So you can just take them and adapt them to your context. 
And that's quite different to, say, uh, many MOOCs, for example, where they're interesting courses, they're good courses you can send people to, but you can't take their content and put it into your own content or adapt it or change it or translate it or take one part from one place and one part from another place and combine them. Um, open educational resources um, are usually good quality. You know, they often come from universities. Uh, there's often kind of national repositories for uh, OER. And there's, that's been going for long enough now that there's a good range available. Um, and so I thought what I'd do uh, partly to demonstrate that is really just to focus on one OER repository, which is, surprise, surprise, the one that's uh, with the Open University called OpenLearn. So I'll go through that in a minute. Um, but first of all, I'm aware there might be a kind of a, a range of experience in, in the audience. Like some people will be very familiar with Creative Commons licenses, people uh, not so much. So without sort of making it a full Creative Commons lecture, I thought I'd just quickly go through them. There's a kind of range of options. So typically open educational resources, part of the definition of an OER is that it has an open license and that will typically be a Creative Commons license. And each of these licenses allows to do different things. So the most permissive license is CC BY. All it means is other people can take it, distribute it, remix it, adapt it, and they can use it for commercial gain. All they need to do is credit the original person. So that kind of, in many ways, that removes a lot of pressure. You can, just, you can do what you want with it in many ways. Um, there's a variation of that, which is CC BY, share alike. So um, you can do all those things again, all that remixing, all that adaptation, but any new creations must be shared under the same terms. What that helps to do is kind of expand the, the commons, if you like, the, the general pool. There's a, there's a no derivatives. It says you can take it what you want, um, but you can't uh, adapt it, you can't change it. And then there's uh, CC BY non-commercial. Um, so other people take it, but they can't use it for commercial purposes. And it does sometimes raise the question about what counts as a commercial purpose. And I'll come on to that. Uh, and then there's some more variations. And, and the last one, CC BY NCND, really just says that people can down, you can download that work, but you can't do anything with it. So that's the kind of most restrictive of these licenses. So it's worth checking just which license um, there is uh, on any OER you come across, because it might vary in what you can do with it. But the good thing about it is what these licenses are is permissive. It means you don't need to ask anyone. Once you've seen what that license is, you can use it in those terms without sort of going to the, the, the creator and saying, I want to use it in this way, so I want to use it in that way. They give you permission to do that automatically. And that's kind of a, a big weight off a lot of people's minds. We can take this, we can do what we want with it, and that's fine. You know, we're, not, we're not breaking any laws. And no, one's gonna, no company's going to come after us with a big kind of, uh, commercial lawsuit. Uh, so I'll, so I'll talk about Open Learn. Um, so that's the URL there, www.open.edu slash open um, And this was set up in 2006 from the Open University uh, with funding from the Hewlett Foundation. Uh, and what we do is we um, a contribute a certain percentage of, of all the new courses we produce um, into Open Learn to kind of keep it going. But also they create kind of bespoke content. Um, and there's some stats there. So they get around 8 million visitors a year. Um, of people coming there and uh, it contains courses, individual learning chunks if you like, uh, badged open courses, you can get a badge for start studying some of them, uh, videos, those kind of things. And they've seen a real uptake since the sort of outbreak of the pandemic, so around 500% increase in traffic since then. Um, and it's got a really kind of high uh, recognition rate amongst the, the, the UK population, about 19% of people sort of know the brand of Open Learn. So it's become a kind of really solid repository and since uh, in the UK anyway, um, the national repository that was run by GISC was closed down. It's now our, our kind of biggest repository. Um, so if you don't know it, it's certainly worth going and uh, having an explore. Um, so what you, you can do there, these things, you can explore lots of different subjects, study free courses, um, get digital badges, explore uh, programs, because we have a link with the BBC as well, um, and boost employability skills. And, and also we have a link into kind of further study for this one. But the good thing is, as, as educators, if many of educators, you can take this content and put it into your own course and adapt it for, for your own teaching purposes. So um, the really good thing is you can uh, download it in many different formats. So it's in Word, Kindle, PDF, uh, EPUB. So you can just take it and download uh, any of them. Uh, and then this is the range of uh, topics that we cover there. So pretty much uh, most of the curriculum, most of the disciplines. Um, so just to come on to that license issue, so our use, our license, and we went around a lot with this, um, and partly it was to 
the version we came down with was CC by NC share alike. So you can't use it for non-commercial um, purposes. Um, and this is from the Open Universities, uh, from the, the frequently asked questions about Open Learn. So it means you must always cite the Open University, uh, maintain the name of the original authors, you can't pass it off as your own work. Uh, um, the share alike part means that you need derivative works that come out from that, you should share under the same licenses. And that can be a bit tricky if you're then combining it with, say, copyrighted material, because you can't make that copyrighted material by Available. But, it, but right, mainly it's there to say you can't take this stuff and then put a license on it and say no, no, no one else can access it. Um, the most interesting part is perhaps the, the non commercial. So it says there you can see there's non commercial to include education institutions, commercial companies, individuals making use of open learning content on a cost recovery basis. So basically, you can use it as an educator. The fact, you know, even if you're charging for your courses, that's fine as a university. But what, we don't, what they don't want is for people to take all of the open learn content um, and then try and sell it or put a, you know, put a, a firewall in front of it and say you've got to pay to access it. So that, that, but, that, that's not, but that's different if you're taking and creating it. So what this means is you could go, you could go there, you can find any content you like from the universe that we've got there. You can just take it and download it in any of those formats. And then the way to create your course, if I was to advise you on creating courses, would be to have ours as the kind of content and what you devise around that are the activities. So you might say, oh, go away and read this um, this piece of uh, uh, material um, on, say, calculus, you know, and then come back and I'm going to ask you some questions about it or we're going to discuss it in a group or those sort of things. So what this sort of content can do, and it's not just at university, there's lots of other um, open education repositories out there, it can do a lot of that kind of heavy lifting for you. It's kind of, it can form the the basis, the spine of your course, what you then do is create the, the work around it, the activities and the interaction and the discussion and maybe the, the testing, those kind of things. But it, it kind of takes away the effort for you to have to create everything around it as well. So that's my pitch for Open Learn and OER, and I'm going to pass over to, to Catherine now to talk about uh, OEP. Okay, many thanks, Martin. That's great. Um, hi everyone. Um, I, as Martin said, we, we're just going to have a little chat maybe uh, before the Q&A session about OER and OEP. But before that, I just have a couple of slides just about OEP, Open Educational Practices. Martin's given a good overview of Open Educational Resources, which is more or less the content of the education, as he described. And Open Educational Practices uh, brings the focus more onto the process. What can we do? Um, when we use openly licensed content and we work in open spaces on the web. So open educational practices, one definition is this, uh, it involves the use, reuse, creation, et cetera, of OER and collaborative pedagogical practices employing social and participatory technologies for any of these, interaction, peer learning, knowledge creation and sharing, and empowerment of learners. So. If we think about opening education in any sense as widening access um, and widening participation and removal of barriers, there are various ways that we can remove barriers. So the Open University, where Martin works, and some of you um, who are here likely work at other <coughs> open universities around the world, um, they remove barriers in terms of previous qualifications, time and distance, and so on. Open educational resources remove barriers of, um, of cost, uh, because the, the resources are available for free, but also restrictions around what you can do with the content. So with OER, you can do whatever you like. And then with open educational practices, we're talking about opening participation in the process of learning. So opening um, the teaching and learning processes themselves. Um, and there are multiple ways um, that, that we can do that to build, share, and co-create knowledge. So three of the, the advantages that are often talked about in terms of open education and OEP are the three items at the bottom of the screen there. Um, the OEP enables um, enhancing access, enhancing the effectiveness of teaching and learning, and also enhancing equity or reducing inequality. And before we go on to kind of the nuts and bolts of OER and OEP, I did want to say just a couple of things around equity because I think in the context of COVID-19 and the current institutional closures. Um, this is something that we're all paying quite a bit of attention to just now. 
Okay. The definition uh, on the screen here from Sen, also used by Thurborn, is just a definition of equality as the capability to function fully as a human being. Um, and Sen goes on to say that this entails um, survival, health, freedom, and knowledge to choose one's life path. Excuse me. Stay on the slide for a moment. Um, <clears throat> and uh, the the second item on the screen there is from the Sustainable Development Goals, uh, number four, which is ensuring inclusive and equitable quality education. Quite often, uh, the value premise for open education is linked to various uh, ones of the Sustainable Development Goals, but most often this one, number four. So um, I want to be clear about my use of equality and equity here. Uh, mo they're used often interchangeably. But when we talk about wanting to reduce inequality in education, um, we can do that through means of um, support, um, enhanced support for people so that they can access education and you know, reduce the barriers, as we've said. Um, but equity really asks us to focus not just on equality of treatment, but equality of outcomes. Um, so I think in the current climate, uh, many of us will know from our students, uh, from our peers, from our family and friends, um, that there are uneven effects of the current crisis um, on our lives. So people, students, for example, might be relying um, on their personal access to technology, their personal access to um, Wi-Fi and internet access. Uh, they may have greater um, caring and support responsibilities, which we have no knowledge of. Um, and they may have, you know, serious um, collapse of financial support, either directly or indirectly. Again, we may have no, we have may, may have no knowledge of those. So this is part of our work always as educators um, to, to seek to, to, to offer equality of education for all. But I think in the particular time of COVID-19 and the institutional closures, this is even more um, extreme and, and needs to really be part of what we're doing. So whether you use the term open educational practices or open pedagogy or, you know, any of the other terms that are used to talk about these kinds of things, uh, the focus of OEP is open, participatory, critical, equitable pedagogies. What can we do um, with these means to enhance equity for students, um, to enhance the quality of teaching and learning? Some of this will be through the use of open educational resources, and some of this will be by, by using open tools um, facilitating students' use of the open web, and so on. So I'm happy to talk about some examples, because I think the examples completely depend on what context you're in. Um, but we just wanted to use this as kind of a, a general introduction, particularly for people who might not have no background um, previously with OER and or OEP. Um, and my last slide is just this one before the discussion. Um, the changes that are taking place right now in our um, higher education institutions are, are rapid, some of them are based on um, limited information and our, um, you know, our role right now is to try and make sure that we rebuild institutions that, as Audrey Water says, value humans' minds and lives and integrity and safety. And that's always important, but no more so than right now. So with that, I will finish and um, maybe hand over to you, Tim, as the moderator and uh, do a time check and see where we are now. Thank you very much to both of our presenters. That was a very clear and interesting uh, introduction and use of the, of the slides, I, if I might say. We're, so we're 20 minutes in now, so if you can take about maybe uh, 10 to 15 tops to, to have a conversation around the topic you, you've brought up, and then I can start to introduce some of the, the questions that are coming up um, in our Q&A okay. channel and also on YouTube. Thank you. Okay, I, I had one question for you, Martin, actually. Um, that arose. I know from, you know, uh, we've known each other for a long time. You, I've seen you engaged in many discussions uh, with people about um, the value proposition of using OER. And for any person in, in any context, they will be weighing up the potential benefits of using any OER with the, the disadvantages or the burden of doing that. Um, and of course, this depends on the context. But, you know, do you see in this time of COVID-19 and institutional closures, that that kind of balancing act has changed in any dramatic sense? Uh, yeah, I, I think so. Um, some of you may remember the idea of learning objects. Uh, at the end of the 90s, the idea of learning objects was 
why do all institutions recreate multimedia materials, say, about teaching the same things, uh, when you could just create like, three or four really good ones that everyone shares? And learning objects never really took off because the, it took too much time to invest in, in making them. You had to describe them with metadata and sort of things. And you could say, oh, we are the, sort of the next generation of that, this kind of shareable content. But I think in the current times, when, when nearly all universities have having to do some shift online, they may not be going wholly online, they may be going blended. But they're all suddenly having to kind of grapple with this idea of uh, online. Then the sort of underlying premise of learning objects might well come to the fore again. It does make sense to kind of have a much more cooperative model in higher education. Why are we all rushing off to rewrite exactly the same, not exactly the same, but similar content? Um, so I think... The, the proposition for OER has never been stronger in many ways. It's that you can have this good quality content that you can take and adapt to your specific uh, context and do stuff around and sort of shorten a lot of that production time. Um, so I think that that's a kind of a good proposition for lots of people, and I can see lots of people take that. I think the, the dangers are is that um, sometimes it's never defined the precise thing you want amongst uh, OER, you will see um, there must be something that does just what I want over here. And you can you can often do, uh, there was a study that I forget what it was wrong, but someone did a study, like they're trying to create a course uh, just solely from OER. And they spent so much time searching and evaluating content that actually they could have just written it themselves. So it's not necessarily as short as you might want it to be, that process. But also I think there's a certain, so you never find exactly what you want. Um, so you do have to accept that you're going to get something that's maybe 80% as good as you want, and then how much do you then spend adapting it? Or do you just use it as it is and then write some content around it? You know, so in much the same way you might do with a textbook. You know, you never have the, fir- the perfect textbook. And I should have mentioned that in, particularly in, in uh, North America, then uh, OER is often represented by open textbooks, so people do, do these open license textbooks. So you can find one that's, that does good enough for what you want, and then you sort of write around it. And there are sort of bigger issues as well. There's issues around kind of uh, cultural imperialism. I think you know a lot of this OER content comes from uh, the global north, for example. So you often just say, stuff. so um, it might not always be precisely for your content, your context, but you can at least adapt it and, and, and vary it. So I think there are. So it's probably not as easy a sell as I might have made out in the original piece, but I think it is still quite. There is still quite a strong case for it in many ways, and just helping people, particularly people who are unfamiliar with shifting the teaching online it's like uh, you know writing a book or something it always helps to have something to start with rather than having to go straight from scratch and the, and the big blank page i've got to create this course well okay if i get this content in from here here and here at least i've got something to work with then at least and i can form a, a basis around that even if i end up having to adapt to most of it Okay, that's helpful. Yeah, um, as you know, as you say, it depends so much on context, but um, certainly that's kind of a global and change that really affects everyone just now. There's so much more online learning. So, I guess my my question back to you, uh, Catherine, mm-hmm. would be um, in terms of uh, OEP, and particularly in in terms of um, sort of different pedagogies that people may have used before. Mm-hmm. Um, there was a bit of a debate that went around about this uh, not long ago in that lots of learners are in an unfamiliar situation moving online. Um, and would that be compounded by giving them a kind of radical pedagogy that they may not have encountered before? So if you were mm-hmm. trying to advise people who were trying to make the shift online that's unfamiliar for them and unfamiliar for the students, mm-hmm. um, kind of what? What are the what are the small steps in open pedagogy that they can do without sort of kind of radically scaring everyone off at the same time? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. Um, no more so than OER. I think there's just so many lenses that we can look at OEP through. So OER, you could be thinking of like you know an open course, like you talked about with you know the, the Open Learn um, example, or you know an assignment or an image, or you know so so it's a different conversation and different. Uh, you know, balancing act goes on depending on the granularity of the OER. And with OEP, likewise, there are just so many practices in, under that umbrella. But, you know, first of all, let me maybe talk about educators um, using OEP, because OEP doesn't necessarily apply to just what we're doing in terms of, you know, um, 
you know, in the classroom, whether that be online or, or in person. So, so many educators, for example, are sharing on open blogs um, and sharing open resources about what they're doing in their in their classrooms, what's working, um, what have they done to make the online shift work work best for them. Um, so that actual open practice of so many educators has been really useful information in the commons, as you said, um, that educators who've never taught openly and uh, online before can learn from. So that simple act of sharing your teaching practice openly is an example of open practice that certainly, you know, you, you can see it everywhere um, on the web. In terms of with students, I think the one of the key features of, of OEP is, is enhancing learner, um, you know, voice, choice, and agency. So students often have to have to separate their formal learning identities and practices and networks from their informal learning identities, practices and networks. And open educational practices provide a way for us to bridge that. So if students are um, in, in a module, is it possible for them to reflect on their current situation or what's going on in their community in the context of that module? Can you help them to connect those formal and informal as I said, um, practices, networks, identities. Um, are there any open spaces where students are working um, that you could help them to bridge to? You know, writing Wikipedia articles, um, creating resources for their community, using open data that's published, you know, in relation to COVID-19 or otherwise to create resources for others. In this moment, I think many um, students are, are, are not only um, wanting to, to continue their education, but also very aware of, um, of the context that they're studying in. So if we can create, help students create any bridges um, to the other parts of their lives from the modules that we're teaching right now, open practices provide you know, some ways for us to do this through open tools, open platforms, social media, blogs, uh, open educational resources, and so on. Yeah, I think as you were talking then, I was thinking um, one of the things I've noticed um, with the kind of online pivot is um, it's really made people rethink or at least examine certain aspects of their education or of how they teach. And I think one of the ones that's really come under scrutiny is, is assessment. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so for, for a number of reasons, I think you know, just the, the classic exam represents quite a, a weak point in, in the whole kind of higher education process because like, it happens at one point, you bring everyone together for it and as pandemic is illustrated if you lose that then it kind of throws out the rest of the course I think lots of people are rethinking what assessment might look like kind of post this and as you were talking then I think perhaps assessment you know in many ways assessment is the kind of the thing right the sort of crown or whatever it is in in higher education it's the thing that matters most often to students um, and I think both OER and uh, OEP that might be the sort of the area where the, the, which is richest for people to explore, I think mm -hmm. they can start to do things that are, uh, David Wiley talks about authentic assessment, you know, and uh, Jesse Stonewall talks about this idea of ungrading, you know, not giving mm -hmm. actual grades. And I think people are beginning to explore that. I wondered if you'd, whether you thought that was a kind of a, a rich area for OEP to, to, to mine. Absolutely. And I mean, I'm just thinking of one example as you're speaking there, um, you know, in, in my own practice, um, teaching in, in, um, in IT, information technology, and a course that I took on a number of years ago, there was a digital media project that had to be produced. And, and so often, because we work in these very strict structures within institutions, we're used to, um, you know, completely defining, you know, the, the terms and the parameters of what that, you know, ass assessment must be. So um, I, you know, over the course of a few years, just peeled back a lot of those layers. And we just, you know, together with the students, we created a, a rubric of how any form of digital media could be assessed. You know, what was the objective of what was to be communicated? Did it do that? You know, how was it how was it um, communicated online? How was it tagged? You know, who, who, were the, who were the audience it was being shared with? And then uh, assessing the content itself. So I invited students to create uh, some form of digital media um, that communicated something to or, or solved a need for an audience outside the bounds of our classroom and, and even the university. So students just took their passions, you know, whether it was guitar playing or sports or dance or um, it, 
collection of animals or whatever it was. And some of them did audio projects, some did video, some wrote blogs and so on. And then we used this rubric that we had developed to, you know, so that they were all assessed using the same criteria. And again, that just notion of, you know, when you, when you provide choice around the subject, around the digital media and so on, you can actually have, you know, wonderful, authentic assessment you know, that where not only is it more enjoyable, but um, students learn, you know, a huge amount. And I think that um, you've probably seen me moaning about this on Twitter, but I think one of the things that this also revealed is that lots of people think about online learning or just education in quite a, a deficit model about why it's mm. not as good as face to face. <laughs> but I think particularly in the sort of work you're talking about, it kind of this gives us an opportunity to explore what you can do differently and what you can improve upon in, in this time and with these sort of resources so you know, it needn't be uh, it needn't, you, should, you shouldn't try and modify and, and model and replicate the kind of face-to-face -face approach but rather take advantage of, of the different things you can do in that, that context Indeed. should we do our, our poll do, do you want to interrupt us <laughs> Well, you were doing so well, I thought I'd just uh, keep on and let you carry on. I mean, I was fairly entertained. I think it would be a, um, a great moment now if you could, uh, if we could have the, the poll questions, please, and then we can uh, carry on forwards afterwards. Yes, I see there are a few questions. That's great. Oh, we've got lots of lovely questions. Mm -hmm. um, okay, here you are. If you are within the Zoom environment, the question should have appeared. For the people in, in YouTube, so that you can actually uh, think about these questions, I'm going to read them out to you. Okay, so the first one is, um, do you think the pandemic will make you more likely to use OER in your teaching? And the suggested answers you have here are yes, no, or not sure. Give you some time to answer that. Do we have the, the second question, please? And now we have the second one. Do you think open educational practice is applicable to teaching in your discipline or area? And once again, we have three answers, yes, no, or we're not sure. So I'll give you a, a minute or so to, to think about that. So we'll uh, we'll have the uh, the answers to these questions uh, in a, in a little while. So I'm going to have. A, have a look at the uh, the questions we've got uh, coming in because there's quite a few of them. It's interesting. Oh, in fact, here we have the um, the answer to the first question, and uh, so the majority of people are saying that they they think they are more like they are likely to use OER in their teaching practice. I think I've got a good sales pitch. I should. Have. <laughs> I think you have. <laughs> <laughs> you've still got twenty percent to convince there. <laughs> okay. Twenty one. Twenty one percent. Okay. In the, in the second one. And once again, good, uh, solid result. Not, not as good as Catherine, though. Catherine is yeah. obviously the more convincing. So. <laughs> She's done a wonderful job there. 78% uh, are saying, yes, I think OEP is uh, directly applicable. OK, let's uh, let's start to introduce some of the, the questions. There are several questions that, that sort of kind of overlap. So I'm going to ask them together as, as one general kind of question. And that is, if you like, the, the difficulty of discovery of appropriate OER to use because I mean you did a great job and definitely if I was looking for for um, OER content in England in English I'd go to um, open learn to look for it but in general if people want to actually to do that and trying to, to to save time I mean how could we go about that do you think it's the time for example that at a national level each country starts to think about some kind of OER network and starts to actually put together easy searchable repositories Over to you, Martin. <laughs> yeah, so I was just trying to type in and uh, find the address. There's a good search engine called Solvenauts, which um, looks for uh, OER, so, so we'll do some of that search for you. But you're right, it's never quite been as, there have been several projects around trying to do this, uh, sort of harvesting the various uh, OER things together. And there's, there are different sites, there's the OER Commons and stuff. Um, 
but it, it can be a bit of a, an effort. So, uh, so someone mentioned Merlot, I saw. So, so Merlot is a good kind of open education repository, but you do often end up having to sort of scout around a few of them and try and find what you want. Um, but you can do, uh, so uh, Creative Commons will do a search for, particularly for things like images and that, which help which are open your license. There are a number of, you know, techniques and tools that will help you with this, but it's probably not, I don't think it's ever quite become as easy as it should be, you know. What you want is just the, the kind of Google for OER, and then just you can put up what you want. But a number of people have worked in that, and I think um, I'm always getting involved in different projects that are proposing a, a new OER repository for um, for Europe or something. Um, and I, I'll put some links in the document actually for different repositories. I'm not doing that, sorry. Uh, so yeah, no, I, do, I take the point, it's probably not as easy as it should be, but I think once you, it's like a lot of these things, you know, it's like there's a bit of initial investment and when you first start doing it, you think this isn't worth the effort, you know, it's like, but then once you kind of get a certain, uh, someone said OERcommons.org, yes, thank you, that's the one I was trying to think of. Uh, yeah, so there are a number of these tools out there, but I think once you kind of get, practice of doing it enough that actually it's not that difficult and it becomes a sort of a habit to you. It's a bit like for people who use social media, I guess. I think often when you first start using social media, it's sort of, it becomes a bit of a, an effort. I've got to put stuff out there and I don't get anything back. But after a while, there's a certain tipping point, I think, when actually it becomes a really useful tool for you and you can kind of save time by asking people questions on there or, or the network does not work for you. So I think it's like that in many ways. You'd kind of have to develop the habits and almost invest some of that initial time in that, in that, in that setup, and then it begins to, to pay off. Okay, thank you very much. Um, a question for, for Catherine here. Um, it's a simple question, but I think it might be difficult to answer. I mean, do all OEP have to include OER? Simple answer is no. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, it's a wonderful question, actually. And it was, I mean, I did PhD research a, a few years ago um, in, in looking at whether, why, and how um, educators in higher education used open educational practices, OEP. Um, and most of the ones who did um, were using the open educational practices independent of OER. So the term itself really kind of think the etymology of the term, I think the, the term OEP arose out of the term OER, where people realized, hey, you know, let's talk about what we can do, you know, in terms of pedagogy and so on, when we're using open educational resources. But in practice, um, I think many people have found, Helen Beetham, myself, and, and others, um, that OEP can arise simply across, as Martin says, through, through our networks, um, through people who come, become familiar with open practice, for example, through their research practice, because you know, open access of research has become you know, quite a mature area now, and realizing, oh, I see so many benefits in this, I think I'd like to translate this to my teaching. Um, so some people come into it, you know, through that path, not necessarily through OER. It doesn't have to include OER, no. Can I just follow up on that? I agree with what Catherine says. Absolutely. We did some research, which was quite a while ago, it was probably 2014, uh, but it was on the teachers. And we asked them about, you know, uh, did they know what OER was? And they, hardly anyone, it's like sort of less than 5% knew what OER was. But mm -hmm. when you ask them, like, do you share resources? Oh, yeah, we all share resources. We all do that. So I think there is a kind of terminology about this after, you know, it's like, I think we could probably use um, simpler terms like sharing, you know, those kind of things. I think. Okay, I think that leads on quite nicely to the, the next question, because when we think of um, open learn, we think of a, an amazing amount of, res of resources that can be down used in are modified slightly and used by teachers. But the, the $50 million question is that do you ever kind of begin to get the snowball effect in the sense that a particular educator will download a resource, maybe they'll localize it into a different language or they'll add some content to it, and do they then push it back up to the, the portal so that other people can actually use their extensions? Is that me again? <laughs> yes, sorry, that question was, was for you, though. I'm, I'm sure I think so, yeah. I mean, so like I, I said, uh, the open and site, we asked for a share alike license, so you should share it back somehow. Um, and uh, one of the sites you can share it back on is we have a, an open and great site, but you needn't necessarily do that. It just means that you shouldn't lock it away, someone else can access it. But I think that that is an extra step, it's an extra piece of effort to kind of share that back into the resources. And often people are quite reluctant to share what they've done back. Um, but it, that is kind of how the 
the global commons grows. But I, uh, as I mentioned in the talk, it can be a bit tricky if, and particularly people are often aren't aware of some of the finer pieces of copyright, you know, so you've, you've taken some open license content, but you've mixed in an image that actually has a, a copyrighted tool or so or picturing it or something and then you, you don't you can't make that opening license you don't own the license to that so you, there's this kind of effect of mixing different media that can make it problematic but in general i think you know if you can share stuff back then that's it, it also demonstrates the the value of this you know so um the a lot of the open textbook sites in in the us and canada so like the open stacks create a lot of really good quality open textbooks um, that I can, teachers can download and then they might decide to change a chapter or just a, a certain what terminology or, or, you know, rephrase the management system. So you can then upload your revised version of, of that particular textbook back into the system for other educators to share and download and, and read. Can I add a note there? I think that's that's great, Martin. And you know, uh, uh, many people in open education talk about the fact that open is not binary. It's not just a switch that you turn and you say, you know, now it's open and now it's not. So as Martin was talking about, you know, this variable licenses that can be, uh, you know, assigned to resources. But even in one's own practice, it's it's not binary either. So, you know, quite often using more open licenses comes with open practice. So, you know, many people I know, I, I'd, I'd say including myself, started out their blogs with a particular license. Maybe it was non-commercial, maybe it was share like, And, you know, as you work in open and you realize that it's much easier to use material that's very openly licensed, you become more committed to that notion of the commons and so on. So, you know, many people, not everyone, you know, migrate to using more and more open licenses. But for people who are just starting, you know, it, you don't have to worry about that. Um, it's about, you know, seeing what's there that's useful to you. Um, remixing if you need to, just being sure that you're correct about the use of licenses. And, you know, there's a lot of, a lot can be learned in these networks of of all of us, you know, as your practice then evolves. Okay, great. Well, thank you. Two great uh, answers. Uh, let's start with you this time, um, Catherine. There's a great question from from Scott Connor. And I think this is, this reflects a, a, a classic uh, um prejudice you can you can pick up from students sometimes and they say and they can even voice them in in the in email or, or course forums and they're saying hang on a second why am i having to pay to do a particular course with you if the contents oer and it comes from another institution how would you how would you answer that well i you know this gets out to this very root question is is what is the value of of what we do you know is it is it the is it the content? Is that why people you know come you know take a course uh, in higher or further education, or is it the learning experience and um, the 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 value of sharing with other people in a learning environment? So I would say that content is only one piece of that, um, and that as Martin said, you know the use of open content means that we can facilitate. Um, different, all different kinds of processes around that content. Um, students can co-create open content as well. It isn't just something that educators do. Um, but another important point that that question raises is, you know, when people make make open resources available that are just, you know, an entire course or something that even has branding from something else, that's not useful. You know, the more granular those resources are when you share them, the more the more easily they can be picked up. Um, chosen in different combinations and remixed by people in different contexts to suit, you know, their students and, and the learning that's happening in their context. So again, this is something that 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 you learn as you become an open practitioner. Um, I don't know if you want to add anything to that, Martin. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I take um, Scott's point. I've I've seen it myself. You know, like um, students can be quite um, conservative in tastes often or expectations, and um, even like from embedding a YouTube clip, which, you know, they'd rather have a badly created one that, that you've created <laughs> than like a really good one from somewhere else, because that's what they've paid for. Um, so I think that, to, to uh, Catherine's point, I think it, it depends what you're doing. I think if actually they, you know, you're using some content in some places, but they're creating activities around it and stuff, and, and, and you're doing interesting activities with them and like engaging with them and getting them to interesting things then that becomes less of an issue because they know that a lot of the work they're doing is just you know is not really the, the content but if you're just going um you know 
here's a course that I've pinched from the Open University. I'll see you in eight weeks when we do the assessment. Then they might <laughs> cause to complain. So, you know, I think that there's, there's a, a range of those things within there, I think. But, but I think Scott is right. Often you, you need to judge those expectations within students. Okay, thank you very much. Um, a good question from Rina here as well about uh, the role of OERs in corporate learning and development. Could um, could you both give us some some suggestions on how uh, how how corporate clients could begin to pull in um, OERs and use them as part of their of their training um, program? Martin, perhaps you could start, please. Yeah, I mean, I guess this gets partly to the non-commercial part of um, of a license. It depends how they're using them, but I think. Um, in, in both ways, actually, so I think both using OER, so sort of finding different content that's out there, and they can adapt it to, you know, to be um, so particularly if it's CC by, they can use it however they want, you know, and adapt it to be applicable to their organisation, you know, and, and I think that that works. And often they'll be getting um, quite good content, and often the people who produce in-house content isn't always that great. <laughs> it's probably a good place to kind of go and get other content from. Uh, but also I think they can start contributing a lot of kind of professional bodies um, and I know the kind of the, the feeling is often with these professional bodies that you know that their content is their is their cash cow it's you know it's where they get money from a lot of the time but actually they could start opening up a lot of that kind of content I think whether that's through MOOCs or open resources to allow people to continually update their kind of professional skills and stuff uh, and share between them as well you know so, to, so they're in the same situation all the time as well you know it's like they're all doing the same sort of health and safety training. They're all, you know, paying out money to these corporate bodies to to provide this. Often they're kind of outsourcing the type of training. Like, well, you know, you could you could quite. It's a bit like the uh, the argument with open textbooks. Instead of buying copyrighted textbooks, uh, you pay people to produce ones that openly license that you can then all use for free. So you can see how corporates might do the same thing. You know, we'll pay people to produce an openly licensed course on health and safety or whatever, these kind of things we got on corporate culture that we can then adapt and reuse, but it's freely licensing. And that will probably end up being cheaper than continually buying and paying someone else's content. Yeah, I'm not sure I have much to add there. I mean, the, the the body that I work for, the National Forum for the Enhancement of Teaching and Learning in Higher Education in Ireland is a, is funded by our um, you know, Department of Education um, and Skills. It's a publicly funded body, and we're very committed to, you know, to making sure that we share, you know, everything that we produce uh, under an open license and also any of the projects that are funded by the National Forum also share their resources openly as well. Yes, thank you. Um, it's interesting what you're saying. I'm picking up in in several questions that are coming along, and also um, experiences of, of the of people are, who are here with us uh, um, today. For example, um, Victoria Hewitt says that uh, she's been teaching at the postgraduate level for uh, for around um, a decade now, and still struggle to get her um, um, HEI to actually support OEP and OER because of this this fear of giving away intellectual property and losing money. I think uh, what you've both been saying makes an awful lot of sense, but in a way, it seems to me to feel it like it's kind of preaching to the converted because it's something you you hear a lot at um, um, open education conferences but once you actually start to move in the ATI environment you find a resistance from the uh, from some of the universities I mean I suppose this is politics in a way more than more than education but do you have some advice you can give to uh, uh, teaching staff who for example now have been forced into this online environment they're looking at doing exactly what you said but they're also getting maybe lent upon by their, their managers who are saying, right, you know, prepare me a course on, on X. I mean, how, could, how would you suggest to them that they try and articulate, articulate the, the need to adopt open educational resources and practices? Um, yeah. Oh, who wants to start? Um, Martin, do you want to start? Okay, I didn't want to keep jumping in. I think you're right. I mean, it, it's often, it, it does feel a bit that sort of preaching to converted with um, open educational resources sometimes. But I think there's a solid case, um, uh, and people have made uh, sort of done good research on this. Like, um, so people like David Wiley and his group in uh, in the US have looked at uh, um, the sort of quality of open textbooks and sort of done you know, controlled trials and found that they're as good, if not better, than um, than uh, copyrighted textbooks. So you know, so the kind of quality issue can be put to one side, and you, you can make quite strong if, if this is the thing you want to do. Quite kind of strong economic arguments for it. So, um, 
Cable Green from uh, uh, Creative Commons worked with some uh, uh, um, schools in, in, in a particular state and they was, how much money they were spending on purchasing textbooks every year for all the schools across that state. If they could offer something like a million dollars to somebody to, to write a textbook, um, which was then openly licensed, and that would still save them, you know, vast sums of money. So there is a kind of strong, if you want, you know, if you want to make the economic argument, it's a strong economic argument to make. It's not just, you know, isn't it a nice altruistic thing to do? You know, I think, and also I think you can make an argument around efficiency. You know, you're better off taking someone else's um, content and adapting it to yours and creating from scratch, particularly if it's not your area. But also using what you know, what you can do best in that area, rather than things you, you don't know as well. So I think. You can make a kind of um, a case fit that, that appeals to management. I think, <laughs> if we could put it like that, you know, that it isn't just based around um, the value of higher education, and we should be sharing stuff. That's kind of education is about sharing. But um, I don't know some people prefer a more kind of neoliberal argument, if you like. And I think there is a case for that to be made. Also, how we are in particular. Yeah, um, I, I'm thinking of some research that I think was done by the OER Research Hub, Martin, by yourself and, and the team there about um, gathering data on, on the use of OER. And in and, and actual fact, many students enrolled on courses because they had, you know, used the resources openly, you know, had, had been able to access them openly and then thereby find out the courses that they wanted to, you know, to take or pursue or so on. So there, you know... Again, this, this notion of the neoliberal argument. You know, there's there's the whole notion of branding and presence and and so on around content, but you know, bringing it back to um, to serving our students now and and the the needs that we that are particularly invisible now. Um, you know, so much of our attention, you know, and all of the people that I'm speaking with who are dealing with this crisis are is around communication and caring for students, you know, the students that we see that are struggling and then trying to reach the students that we can't see because, you know, I haven't talked to anyone who, who said that they haven't, you know, some students haven't been lost in this process, uh, you know, again, for a number, number of reasons. So, so much time and effort is required for us to be able to serve um, and, and continue learning um, through this crisis, that the use of open resources um, amongst each other as a way to share, you know, just with each other, you know, in, a, in an institution, in a national sector, as well as internationally, makes makes so much sense, particularly because so many of the people who are teaching online now have never taught online before. You know, we just did um, uh, an online survey of the digital experience of students and staff in Ireland last autumn, and the results were published a couple of weeks ago. And last autumn, 70% of, of um, people, of, of staff who teach, said that they had never taught in a live online environment before. And that's on par with results from the UK and other countries. Um, and now it's, what is it? Is it a hundred percent? You know, we have very, very, very many um, staff and students who have never learned, taught and learned online before. Um, and, and open educational resources are a key way that we can, you know, share what we're doing, support one another so that we can spend time on the work that's really vitally important now so that we can, that we can continue because also the, the commitment that staff have made and faculty to continue teaching in this way is not something that can be done you know, at this level continuously, um, you know, m many people are, you know, just utterly exhausted. So um, to the extent that um, people are looking at, at what's happening now and saying, oh, this is great. We've done this. Isn't this terrific? You know, there's an awful lot of people who are on their knees at this stage, uh, you know, because they've done such a good job keeping teaching and learning and assessment going. So we need to have a bigger picture. And I think OER is a, is a, is a huge part of that picture. Thank you very much. I'm going, to, I'm going to push on because I'm, I'm conscious of our time uh, disappearing now. Another um, constant that's come up in, in a few questions that I can like to put together is the question of quality. I mean, for example, I mean, um, Drivnod Kumar Yarav asked a spe specific question. Um, how can we actually handle the issue of quality in OER? Because um, by analogy, if I go and buy a textbook from a, a, a world-class publisher, then I can be pretty sure the contents is going to, to have been heavily revised and it's going to be good. And I'm pretty sure if I download some content from OpenLearn, it's going to have passed through some kind of quality cycle. 
quality control cycle. But in general, in general, what kind of uh, what advice would would you both give um, give us about ways of actually being careful of being sure of the of the quality of what we're actually downloading? Uh, Martin, perhaps you could you could start there, please. Uh, yeah, you know, it's an issue that often comes up. I think um, you know, so the first thing is to you can start by going from trusted providers. You know, as you said, if you get it from Open Learn, but also people like OpenStax, uh, we can get these open textbooks from, and that they've been through a similar kind of review process. Um, or people like BC Campus have been producing them for um, Canadian higher education. So there are, there are a number of kind of good providers out there. And secondly, I think, you know, as an educator, you can trust your own instincts. You know, you'll know if content is good and is applicable in your particular context. Um, so you, you can make that own judgment yourself. Sometimes it might just be, a, you know, a simple video that explains something very neatly, you know, and you don't need to know anything about the providing. But, you, know, you, are, you are often the expert in your area, so you, you can get that, I think. I, I guess the only issue is sometimes um, with... Um, with open, it can be adapted a number of times, you know, and so you know, several iterations down the line, maybe some of the kind of original message has been lost or adapted, and you know, can even mean the opposite. So um, there's a there's perhaps a danger in um, students sort of going off and finding stuff that isn't valuable. But I think it, again, you know, um, perhaps Catherine will probably speak more to this, but there's certainly a lot of value in helping students to understand and evaluate content themselves, you know, and to understand what represents good content. You know, what are good ways of judging where it's come from and the particular bias it might have, you know, so uh, people, people don't know, uh, Mike Caulfield writes very well about this and he's got this framework called the SIFT framework for looking for misinformation, those kind of things. I think anything that gives you an opportunity to kind of teach those digital skills is actually a very useful thing to be doing as well. Yeah, 100% to that, Martin, absolutely. And, you know, I, I do find myself sometimes challenging also the premise that, you know, I, uh, textbooks from publishers are, are the perfect thing. I mean, they may be very well produced and they may not have any, you know, errors as such in them, but are they, you know, appropriate to your cultural and disciplinary and local context? Um, sometimes there's bias in there in one way or the other. So, you know, to find open resources that are perhaps produced by, you know, national bodies or national projects or, you know, other others in other countries, um, that you find out about through your networks or through good sources, but the, to be able to adapt those, you know, for your students, for your context around language, examples, case studies, and so on, um, results in something sometimes that's that's much better, you know, than a set open textbook produced by, you know, a well-known publisher. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Right, we're very near to the end of this um uh, this webinar. I'm extremely grateful to our two speakers. I think it's been very, very interesting. I'm also extremely uh, grateful to all the, the questions that I've tried to group together to get as many answers as possible. Let me just uh, ask tie together two particular questions that I've seen and also invite you to make any final comments. So we've talked about um, OER and OEP in general and how it's uh, been used in this in this time of, of the pandemic. So the, the obvious question is what's going to happen afterwards? And I think we can we can do this by pulling together the questions from Dorita and Sedia that says in a way what's going to happen now to the future of, of education, specifically schools? Will it be replaced to some extent by um, OEP? And also um, what are the implications of this of this forced online emergency teaching in terms of changing to open pedagogy um, in terms of general openness and accessibility I mean what's going to be the role of OER and OEP in the in the post pandemic era um, Catherine perhaps you'd like to start please I don't know and and to an extent that's that's really up to us um, but I think um, my role in in my in my day job and in my conversations in like this around open education is 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 just trying to shine a light on um, a huge body of work that exists already in open education. This is a field that is that is fairly new in in in, in terms of um, you know the context of education as a whole. But there's an enormous body of research practice. Um, and, and people who've been do doing this for quite some time that we can learn from. So this is not new. Uh, online learning is not new. Um, and to those who, to whom it is new, um, I, I think I, I think I'd speak for everybody in open and online education to say, you know, that we we're, we're happy to share resources. That's one of the reasons we created that document for the presentation. I'm going to be happy to go back through the questions that I missed 
here um, and pop some resources in there um, because events like these are, you know, it's kind of a, it's, it's a drop and perhaps we've answered some questions, but I'd like to see these, these kinds of events as part of an ongoing conversation of us supporting one another. Um, you know, I, I don't know the, the context specific questions that, 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 that may arise here, but I'm happy to have conversations to help solve those problems. Uh, yeah, like Catherine, I also don't know. <laughs> and, and, and you shouldn't trust anyone who says they do know, because who knows how it's going to pan out and this kind of thing. Uh, I think there's both an opportunity and a risk for open and distant education online education. The, moment. the kind of risk is that everyone's done a very sudden pivot to online. Um, and I think students were kind of sympathetic when that was a kind of emergency and what you could do over a week or two. But come the new term in September, October, um, if it's still not very good quality and it's just like streaming lectures and uh, we'll get lots of online learning, it's terrible, it's nowhere near as good as face-to-face uh, -face learning and let's never do that again. So it could, in some ways it could set it back a long way. Um, the, the opportunity is that actually if people do well, you know, people will begin to see that actually there are different affordances, different opportunities that you can um, I'll take you to online learning and do different things and it might help us rethink some of those kind of fundamentals of education that we often don't question because they just seem seem normal like how you do assessment and those kind of things and, and how you and the fact that you give students a, a set textbook rather than getting them to you know co-create an open textbook all those kind of things so I think that it, so both those things exist simultaneously at the moment and I'm not sure which way it'll go it'll probably be a mix of both I think. That's great. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Catherine, and thank you, Martin, for a very interesting and entertaining uh, webinar this afternoon. We're very grateful to both of you for having been here with us. Thank you also for everyone who's uh, who's been here listening to these presentations and participating with your questions. I'd also like to thank my colleagues, Lisa and Diana, for uh, the support in the background with uh, the questions and the, uh, the, the Zoom tools. And um, just to uh, remind you that on the 21st to the 24th of June, as, as shown in the chat, we'll have our uh, 29th Eden 2020 annual virtual conference. So please register. Registrations open for that, and you can see some of the speakers coming up on the um, on the on the screen there. So please uh, please take part um, with us uh, in this uh, in this conference event. And also in a couple of days' time, and on Wednesday the 27th at uh, five o'clock CEST, we have our next Eden NAP webinar on designing online courses for digital skills and competencies for the creative industry. So uh, please uh, uh, register for that, and I think it's going to be another another interesting event. So thank you very much, everybody, and goodbye. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thanks.